What's happening, Jordan? What's up, Sam? How you doing, man? I'm great, man. Very excited for our guest today. Mike Boyd, uh, long time coming on this episode. Mike Boyd runs artist relationships and music strategy for Gary Vee and VaynerMedia. Uh, as you guys may or may not know, I used to work at VaynerMedia on a team called Vayner Talent that was kind of replicating what Gary did for his personal brand, for other talent, musicians, entrepreneurs. Mike, at the time... Um, was always Gary's right-hand man when it comes to anything music and still is today. I don't know if you guys follow Gary Vee. Obviously, he's a marketing and entrepreneurial thought leader, um, very notable online presence and personality, and ultimately runs just a very successful 900-person ad agency. And I think what was always fascinating to me, and it's funny too, because one of the reasons that I was so drawn into Vayner was because of of how Gary was able to develop and maintain this relevance in this, this hip hop world that I was such a big fan of. Right. And at the end of the day, as I was kind of tuning into Gary's vlogs, it was it, Mike Boyd was the plug. He was the guy behind the scenes that was always connecting the dots, making it happen, setting up all these conversations. I think beyond brokering and, and helping Gary maintain this relevance, um, Mike also manages an incredible producer, Richie South. Uh, he has numerous, uh, tons of awesome records that have performed really, really well and has some incredible work on the way. Mike has always just had this ear, right? I think he was, uh, I remember him telling me a story at Vayner where he actually like taught Future how to make and helped him make his like Facebook page. When Mike told me that, I went to go check Future's Facebook page and I was like, this has like 7 million plus people at the time. And that was like a year or two ago. So I think um, Mike helped get Gunna on one of Gary V's shows and Gary V's YouTube channel before Gunna even popped off. So I think he just always has this very progressive ear. He curates the Monday to Monday playlist. He recently launched the Monday to Monday podcast. I think uh, Mike has a, a big breadth of knowledge for managing artists, being well networked, helping create successful, sustainable artist careers brokering brand deals. He helped out Vayner and Sabra Hummus on the Super Bowl commercial that aired this year with Megan Thee Stallion and some other artists and people. So tons of really incredible topics in today's episode. Really excited to dive in. What did you think, Jordan? Yeah. Um, one thing that I really liked that I wasn't necessarily expecting us, expecting him to tell us, but he really got into his a &R process when he goes and looks for artists from Monday to Monday to work with Gary Vee. Um, and it's very logical and it makes sense. And I think a lot of people will be able to benefit from that. I also think the way that he explained the way he networks, which is just kind of going to events, it kind of overlaps from the it's the real episode. Um, and, you know, he get when he gets deep into that, I think people will really appreciate that. Um, and obviously, like I've said a million times, people who, you know, have been able to diversify and, 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 and do a few things in the industry are, you know, some of my favorite, some of my favorite guests. So I'm glad that we have Mike on and, and that you guys can, can hear about his multiple areas of his career. For sure. Well, without any further ado, let's get into it. Let's do it. Mike Boyd, what's good, bro? How you Ooh. feeling? Oh my God, I'm feeling good. How you doing? Fantastic, man. Very excited to have you on to the, the podcast today. Long time coming. For real. I've been waiting. The time is now. It's your <laughs> chance, bro. It's your chance. Um, so I think very excited for this conversation because I feel like you have exposure and experience across a, a lot of different facets within the music industry, both on the brand side and the artist side, on the a &R side, management side. So very excited to dive into all of those different elements. For starters, though, could you just talk a little bit about how you ended up kind of your your path to where you are today? Just yeah. like a one-minute version? Yeah, one-minute version. Um, I've always been the type of kid who was like, well, growing up, I was always the type of kid who was interested in finding out who was next. So, like, I'd be early on artists and tell all my friends, burn CDs, all that. And then in college, I worked for a Warner Music Group, mm -hmm. WIA. They were, like, marketing, college marketing. Where'd was, you go to college? The city of Boston, Boston oh. University. Mm -hmm. Went to Boston University and then uh, moved to New York. I had known Gary's brother mm -hmm. from college, and we stayed in touch. And so when I moved to New York City, I was actually moving here to work for Atlantic Records because Warner had told me, you know, if you moved to New York, you could get a job at Atlantic. You just got to, like, go through the interview process and all that. And I told AJ, I was like, yo, I want to meet your brother, Gary. I want to get my selfie with him for Twitter, <laughs> for my profile picture, because it was 2009 and Twitter, Twitter, was, hot. Twitter was hot. And uh, <laughs> I met Gary, did a quick intro. He knew exactly who I was because AJ had told him before. There's a long story behind that. And then uh, 
he hired me on the spot, you know. He was like, I want you to work for me. Don't work for any of these labels. I want you to do music partnerships, like build my relationships with artists. Mm -hmm. And you had built a blog at at some point along this journey, right? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think, I mean, you were have like one of the earlier interviews with like Future and some of these other artists before they are anywhere close to where they are today. Yeah, so it was actually me and Gary, we decided to create a blog, Hip Hop at Lunch. The interviews are on YouTube still. And it was a way to get close to these artists for Gary and myself. I figured what better way to get these relationships going than the interview. Mm -hmm. So I do all my research, go do a really good interview, in my opinion, where I ask them deep questions about the music Mm -hmm. and about their personal lives or their public lives. And all the artists were impressed by someone who actually cared about them enough Mm -hmm. to do the research. Yeah. So then we were able to keep the relationship alive and... We uh, tried to do a brand deal with 2 Chains back when he was still Titty Boy. Did a brand deal with Travis Porter early on. um, Early on in my career, 2009. And tried to do a few others. It it was just, you know, brand deals aren't the easiest thing to do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right on. And then what do you think... um, so then what, how has your role evolved to what you're doing today? Because, I mean, from my eyes, I think to some extent, I feel like you're like a professional plug. <laughs> you just got all, all these different connects and, and are liaising and making, connecting the docs, making the connections, both on the, the high level top tier artists, as well as still have your ear on the ground floor for some of these emerging acts. So can you talk about kind of what, how you currently allocate your time and what your current like responsibilities and goals are? Yeah. So one of my main goals is keeping Gary Vaynerchuk in line with like who's the hot new artist, Mm -hmm. Um, keeping him updated, keeping like his ear on the proper tracks that he needs to hear. Um, He just is a really busy person. Who who, who are you pushing it to him right now? Um, Lil Keed still. I think Lil Keed's next project is going to be big. Six four five AR. I liked what he's doing. He stopped by the office, right? Yeah, he stopped by a couple times. He just stopped by last week. That's dope. And we played uh, video games. <laughs> That's dope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we played NBA 2K. Um, who else? It's hard for me to think, man, But about like the playlist. But right. update the playlist every week, and that's who we're listening to. Mm-hmm. Um And then outside of that, I mean, kind of brokering meetings. Then there's the, the brand collab element, right? Yeah, yeah. So main thing is connecting Gary with artists and making sure the relationships are alive. And well, healthy. And what happens is Gary has the ad agency Vayner Media. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times the brands want to collaborate in the music space. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times one of the first things they do is they call me in and they say, Hey, this brand wants to go after Philadelphia or this brand wants to be popular in Atlanta. And like we want artists that have five thousand followers or less, or mm-hmm. maybe we did the Super Bowl commercial. We want some big artists from this world or a big artist from TikTok or this or that. And I help put together the pieces mm-hmm. and help connect the dots. And a lot of times what happens is, you know, we go to our strong relationships. And a lot of times those relationships are people that we've met through Gary meetings mm-hmm. or through my playlist right. or through my podcast mm-hmm. or through Richie, my producer, Richie South. So, you know, we will reach out to people like Meg the Stallion. We did the Super Bowl commercial with her. We put her in the Super Bowl commercial, but she's never met Gary. Mm -hmm. I've met her. She's never met Gary. We still did this. We don't only work with people we've met, Mm -hmm. but it makes it a lot easier to work with people you know. Right. Yeah, of course. 100%. And then when it comes to, uh, I mean, one thing that I respect a lot too is like the, uh, I mean, it it does feel like you have a good ear. I mean, I guess technically you're not like an A&R by a record label, but a big part of your job is recruiting and understanding, keep your finger on the pulse. And I think like, Super early on nurturing that relationship with Future. Um, I think Gunna and Gary V were creating content f- like a year or two before like Gunna truly exploded up to where he's at today. Like, yeah. what for, from your perspective, having seen tons of artists, many who have popped, many more who probably haven't, what are you looking for as far as artists that you think are going to pop? What are the different like factors or elements at play that to you signal that like something's something's cooking right here? So, I look at a lot of factors, actually. I listen to the music, and I actually pay attention to, like, the music itself. That's really important to me. Um, How emotional it is, how creative it is, 
I like it when artists use words that other people aren't using, you know, like uniqueness. Um, but then I look at the team. Do they have a good manager or managers? Um, are they surrounded by the right people? Who's co-signing? You know, if it's if it's far enough in their career that people are actually co-signing them, like who is co-signing? Mm-hmm. What's their track record? Um, fashion, you know, like what do they look like? What do they dress like? Mm-hmm. Um, collaborations, you know, obviously collaborations are big. Like not only was Gunna coming up at the same time, but so was Lil Baby. So they were working together a lot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And neither of them were big, but, you know, a lot of times, someone told me one time, some music industry guy who I used to work with, he told me one time, uh, you know, you're looking at someone thinking they're going to blow up. And a lot of times it's the person standing next to them. Mm. You know what I mean? Oh, damn, yeah. So you you can't like discount whoever else is in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that for sure. It's exciting. Um, How do you keep those relationships healthy that you're talking about? That's part of your job. What's 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 something that you do to keep those healthy? I know obviously you have them come into the office, but um, do you guys do events or anything like that? Or no, we don't do events, but I connect the dots. So, for example, there's this um, Latin artist I really like, and his manager just hit me up. He was like, "Hey, you know this big hip hop star? We want to do a remix to a song." And if I could help him, I'm going to help him. You know oh, what I wow. mean? Like, right. I'll connect the dots just off the love. Um, you know, like they say, relationships are only strong if you work them. It's like a muscle. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, like, I'm I'm working my relationships. Um, the playlist is a good way to, like, keep the relationship strong. Like, when, a, when an artist drops a new song and I put it on the playlist, they see the love. Because... We're not the biggest playlist in the world. We have uh, 81,000 followers, which mm-hmm. is pretty good. But it's not like rap caviar. Well, yeah, that's huge. That's huge. <laughs> that's massive. <laughs> but uh, the fans of the playlist, they're, they're really active. Right. And so like Tierra Wack, for example, I think she told me that she still gets DMs saying like, oh, I, I heard of you on Gary's playlist. That's you know? awesome. Yeah. So it's like. Like I oh, Stash, he's a New York rapper. Mm-hmm. He posted a DM today. It was a person from Berlin, and he said the, the DM said, "Hey, when I heard your music on the Monday to Monday playlist, I assumed you were huge, and then I went to your page, and you have fifteen thousand plays per month. Don't give up. You're gonna make it. Like I believe in you. Love from Berlin." And he posted that DM on his uh, IG story. So it's like little things like that where. An artist like Stash, like the song had less than a thousand plays when I put it on there, but he was really like spitting his soul and heart and everything into the song. So I was like, this has to be on my playlist. I put it as number one. And uh, like, that's how the playlist like really helps out an artist, an emerging artist. And then they never forget us. Right, right. Um, so it seems like what you do naturally just overlaps a lot with management because a lot of management is also just like connecting the dots and being that resource for your artists to like, channel their vision through you and then you kind of do what you're saying, you know, putting them in the room with people, things like that. Yeah. Um, how do you think, you do you, you manage anybody else or just Richie? Right now, just Richie. I have managed other people and tour managed, but I only manage Richie right now. Oh, you tour managed while you're working for Gary Vee too? No. Okay, I was about to say, that's a hell of a job in <laughs> itself. <laughs> tour managing kicks yeah. people's asses. Yeah, that <laughs> was <up>. hard. <laughs> right. Um, what is it like managing a producer? I think a lot of people, at least that listen to our podcast, don't really know what it's like. I mean, I can speak to that a little bit, but Richie South is a pretty big producer. So what type of things do you do for Richie that you may not do for, you know, a rapper or a pop act? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for saying Richie's pretty big, man. We've been working hard. I've been managing Richie for six years and, uh, I think it's been six, five or six. And I co-manage Richie right now with Dan Friedman. So shout out to Dan. But um, what do I do for Richie? I connect the dots for Richie, like you were saying. You know, it's based off his vision, like who he wants to work with. Every now and then, he'll send me a list. He'll send me and Dan a list. It'll say, hey, these are the 15 artists that I want to work with. Mm-hmm. Can you guys connect the dots? Richie is a, more of an artistic person where it's like, he wants to work with people who sound good on his beats. He doesn't just want to work with the hottest artists at the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, he wants to work with people who he thinks he will sound good with. 
And Richie has a real melodic, smooth. It's still Atlanta. It's still trap, but it's melodic sound. He plays the keyboard. He taught himself. So um, Richie tells me what he wants, and I help put it together. And then at the same time, like you were saying, there's overlap from my job because I'm finding these artists. Right. And so I'll be like, hey, man, this artist is dope. You should check him out. And you maybe should work with him. And if he likes it, I connect the dots. Or it happens in reverse where Richie tells me, hey, this artist is really dope. I don't know how Richie found the artist and all the time. Like he doesn't really tell me all the time, but <laughs> he'll be like, this artist is really dope. I sent him some of my beats and they've been working on it and it's sounding crazy. He did it last night. He told me about two artists and he was like, these artists are really sick, man. So I followed him on Instagram. I uh, made a note to check out their music for the, for the playlist. So Richie puts me on, I put him on. Whenever I could connect the dot, I do it. Whenever he could introduce me to someone, he does it. So we're like a team in that way. Right. Um, I make sure he gets paid. You know, I do the invoicing, stay up with the labels, talk to the A&Rs. Um, me and Dan, like, collaborate on that a lot, like figuring out how much this beat is worth or how much, you know, we need for a placement. But Richie's a really smart person. You know, he doesn't he doesn't have a lot of distractions. He doesn't do drugs. He doesn't have a lot of things holding him back or getting in the way of like a productive day. So it's not too it's not too hard working with him. I think an artist is harder because a lot of times the artist has a lot going on out in their personal lives where it's like distracting from the career. But Richie's career focused, you know, like Richie has spreadsheets. Like he knows exactly mm. how much he needs to pay me. And when, like, he knows, he knows what's up. Like, I don't even have to worry about anything with Richie. Like, Richie, Richie will be like, hey, you know, did we get paid this amount of money from this artist? Because we did the song on this date. Like, he knows his stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Have Which makes ever, my job easier. Yeah. Have you ever awesome. told Richie be rich? Ha! <laughs> Sorry, bro. I've said I, it. I had to do it. <laughs> I've said it. You know, Gunna, Gunna was the first person to say that. That's where that comes from. But, yeah, um, I've said the, I've said the tag. <laughs> I don't say it as much as other people say it, but yeah. That's fun, man. What do you think uh, when it comes to growing artists? I mean, you said you've been working with him for six years. I think he's making tons of progress and on some major records. You've also been in, I mean, you've seen other artists blow. You also broker a lot of these meetings with Gary where he's giving tons of valuable advice. You're sharing your own advice and perspective. When you're looking at emerging artists, from your perspective, what are things that those artists and their team should really be focusing on developing in the earlier stages of their career? They should be building a good team. You know, um, the more I talk to artists and managers and producers with my podcast, even, you know what I mean? Because like ever since I launched that, I've been interviewing artists, managers and producers. And mm -hmm. that's one of the topics everyone's been telling me is that like, the most important thing to them is, to them is their team. Mm -hmm. I just think like, if you have a manager who believes in you, that's almost the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Like they might not be super connected. They might not um, know the game. But as long as they believe in you 100%, they'll figure out the rest. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly was your question again? Just the most important things to focus on when trying to build a foundation for a successful career as an artist. Yeah, so team focused on like what your goals are like how richie will send me a list of artists he wants to work with so like having clear goals that you could accomplish mm -hmm. um Lil Keed's manager told me that one thing they do is they they don't necessarily like focus on a goal that's too far out it's almost like month to month they're knocking out goals you mm -hmm. know and i thought that was cool because it's like um you're able to like more quickly achieve your goal so it's mm -hmm. like you're on you're like building a momentum i think right. that's cool for sure small wins stacking them yeah. So yeah, I was um I was talking to somebody because people used to send me submissions. I still do for me to like manage them or whatever. Um, and a couple people have come back like a good amount of times. Like, yo, check out this, check out this, check out this. And I hit them back, and I'm like, yo, I think this is cool, but the fact that you've shown me this much already, and I'm not into it, means I'm not good enough for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, your manager has to be in love with your music and want to run through walls cool. with your music. And yeah. like I'm I'm telling you that's not me. So you need to find someone that is good for you. Cause I'm not gonna be the one to take you where you wanna be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it's how it is. So I, th- I think that I think the the synergy with the team is almost you know it's more important than anything else. Sometimes it's just like why don't we just go get dinner? <laughs> like let's uh-huh. we don't got to talk about music. Let's just go get dinner. Mm-hmm. Let's play video games. Let's I don't know talk about women. You know what I mean? Like let's just let's just do something to keep the keep the synergy between everybody like positive and good. So by the time we do talk about music, things aren't so robotic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So. I just called my, you know, my client earlier today. He was like, "What's up? What you need?" I was like, "Bro, I'm just saying, hey, I'm just checking in. I'm just being like, what's up, bro? Like, what was you doing today, man? We could talk about business. There'll be a time and a place for that. But right now, I'm literally just checking in on you. Mm-hmm. You know, for sure. So, yeah, 100%. I call Richie every day. Right. right. That's awesome. When it comes to um, co-managing Richie, what, what, in your experience, are the benefits of co-managing versus managing solo? Um. Co-managing is cool because it's like less pressure on me. I have a team that I can rely on and Richie's in good hands. Like if something were to happen to me or if I weren't able to like give him enough focus as I, as he needs for a month, you know, I got my co-manager there to, to help me out Mm -hmm. in the same way goes for him. Like if he's busy, if my co-manager is busy, then I'm able to help him out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it was totally worth it for me to have a co-manager. It was my idea. You know, I told Richie, I was like, hey, man, we should we should have Dan Friedman co-manage. Like, obviously, Dan wanted to do it, mm-hmm. but I was the one who was telling Richie, like, we need to do this. Mm-hmm. And so me and Richie sat down with Dan multiple times for food at Bear Burger in New <laughs> York City. And uh, we had a lot of fun, and Dan's the man, so... It was an easy decision. It's just, it's a big decision. And Richie's the type of person who doesn't do things lightly. So he just wanted to meet with Dan a couple of times. I've known Dan for like maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I always knew Dan was awesome. But um, yeah, like I said, it was my idea because I was like, if anything ever happens to me, I need Richie to be okay. So that was like the main thing. And also Dan having so much experience in in the producer world, I was like, who better to help? You know, who who better to co-manage than someone who's worked with Mike Will, worked with Metro Boomin, right. worked with Southside, mm-hmm. you know, like worked with all these artists, or, I mean, producers who um, have become artists, but also producers who've just done so much. Like, if I'm going to have a co-manager, like that's the dream co-manager. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I also think co-managers can balance out in addition to like helping um, time and splitting the time. I think they can also balance out your strengths and your weaknesses. You know, definitely. So, uh, me being like as early on in my career as I am, I'm my Rolodex isn't as deep as my co manager, but I work very hard and I'm very organized. So, we kind of have a brain trust where we share things with each other. Yeah, for know? sure. For so, sure. Yeah. Yeah. The notion of building complementary strengths on a team is like so valuable. You know, my team is the same thing. Like, there's, we have like multiple people on our team. But the, the kind of three of the people that are mostly engaged, my business partner, I mean, I guess my two business partners, we all fill in those holes to create yeah. this like perfect puzzle, which is right. exciting. Right. Um, you're going back to Mike being the plug. How, 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 how does one the develop plug. such plug? Like, how have you got such a, pluggery? How does one develop the pluggery? Yeah. <laughs> no, on a serious note, um, you're very well networked. What are different things that have helped in your journey of developing such a strong network that can be helpful for other people that are listening to the podcast that all are trying to develop their own networks? Um, AKA pluggery. A, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, when I moved to New York City, I didn't know a lot of people at mm-hmm. all. And so I would go to events and especially the smaller events where a lot of people aren't there. I'd, I'd, I'd be like the first person at an mm-hmm. event. I'd go by myself and I'd see someone who looked cool. And I was like, you know what? That person probably works with the artists. Mm. And so I'd just go up to him. I'd be like, like, let's say it's a Yo Gotti event. I'd be like, hey, man, you work with Yo Gotti? And they'd say, hopefully they'd say yes, but it, actually it doesn't <laughs> matter what they say because now I like broke the ice. Right. So they'd be like, no, I don't work with Yo Gotti, but I work at this record label. Or no, I don't work with the artist, but I'm a PR agent mm-hmm. or something. And I'd be like, oh, that's cool. And I'd tell them what I do. And then we'd have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And then I just met another person, you know. Mm-hmm. So just I just kept meeting people, getting their contact info, following up. Um, early on, I know one manager was like, man, you always keep your word. 
because I would like tell someone like I'm gonna text you tomorrow and I would do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm gonna email you later and I would do it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like the number one thing I feel like that happens a lot in the music industry that like nobody really talks about, but it happens so much. It's like, yo, let's let's link, let's link. All right, bet nothing. <laughs> like that happens so much. Yeah. It happens so. Uh, give me give me your email. You shoot. Oh, it's me. Intro. The intro be the only email y'all ever sent to each other. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah, it happens yeah. so often. So that's awesome that you do that. <laughs> well, I used to do that. I used to be really good at it. And lately, like you know, I meet someone. And I'll be like, yeah, shoot me an email who you're working with, like give me a list of who you're working with and I'll look at it. And if there's an opportunity to like connect the dots right away, like we'll do something. But you know, like there's a lot of people who I've emailed once with as well lately in my Mm -hmm. life. But early on I was, I was hungry. I didn't have anyone. So everyone I got was important. It was really important to me because I didn't have any connections. But uh, nowadays I'm just so busy and it's like, I'll, I'll tell people at a label, I'll be like, yeah, shoot me a list of your clients. And then if they have, you know, like Jack Harlow, A Boogie, whoever it is, I'll be like, yeah, oh my God, let's set up a meeting with Gary. Or, hey, let's have him come on the podcast. Or, hey, let's have him come play video games in the office. But if it's not someone who I could fit into any of those categories, then, you know, that might be the last time we email. Mm-hmm. Or I'll be like, yeah, you know, just keep me updated. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just trying to be honest with people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or if I meet like, 15 people in one night, it might be hard for me to get back to everyone these days. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Hit 15 people the next day, that's already taking up enough time the next day. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, yeah, yeah. Does that still happen? Do you connect with like that many people? And Lately, now yes, because so when I moved here, it was so long ago. And I feel like the music industry, like the people who stay in it, it's not a lot of people. You know, Mm -hmm. I feel like it changes out or people get older and they don't go to these events anymore. So now that I'm going back to events again, I'm starting to meet all the new people, you know. So I'm starting to meet people who are younger than me, who have like these great jobs and work with great artists. And so I need their contact info. So I will meet like 10 people a night. Mm. You know, I'm lucky enough to be able to meet 10 people a night. And because I haven't been in the game I have I've been in the game for a long time, but I took a step back and didn't go to a lot of events for a long time. And now I'm going again. Right. Trying to get to know the new generation. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um when it comes to the notion of knowing the new generation too, outside of uh having an ear for artists, I feel like thematically too, I mean, I think you were an early believer in kind of like the prevalence of like, if you will, like Latin trap. I don't necessarily love like genre buckets or terms, but I feel like you, a lot of the music you were sharing and talking a lot about and some of the artists you were bringing through and the playlist. How do you go about identifying like different like sonic trends? And is that something you pay attention to or is it more important for artists just to like, just go in, in, in their own unique lane without really trying to pay attention to any like trends? Um. Well, the first part of your question, like, how do I identify like what's gonna be hot? Yeah. Someone told me one day, like if 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 people really care and they're really passionate, you gotta pay attention. And so when I see people going crazy, like however many years ago, like four years ago or five years ago, whatever, mm-hmm. for J Balvin, like I paid attention, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm lucky enough to be around a whole lot of people who listen to music in Spanish. Mm-hmm. Um my mom's Mexican American, but I'm not fluent in Spanish. But my wife is from Par- Paraguay, and so she's fluent in Spanish. Her parents speak Spanish. Her cousins speak Spanish. Her friends speak Spanish. Whenever Sounds we, like it's time for you to get fluent in Spanish. Yeah, <laughs> I've been studying. I've been studying. But um, your mom and your wife gonna start talking behind your back. You're like, hey, uh, what? You- <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've been studying, but it's like, you know, my wife is super passionate about a song Mm -hmm. or her cousin is or whatever. I'm like, damn, you know, there must be something there. Right. No matter what. Like if if people feel that strongly about something, there has to be something there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I pay attention to it. The music is good. You know, like I said before, when I listen to new artists, I pay attention to the music. The music's good. Even if you like I I told Gary one time, you know, you want to meet a whole lot of uh, music a whole lot of artists that make music in Spanish, I know you don't speak Spanish. 
And he he said something cool and funny. He was like, you know, I don't understand everything the mumble rappers are saying either. <laughs> he was like, but a good song's a good song. <laughs> so yes, I want to meet these artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, he's like, I like the song. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> that would, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, so congrats on launching your podcast. Thank you. How's that been going so far? I love it. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision behind the podcast? Yes. So we called it Monday to Monday, which is the same name as the uh, playlist. And luckily, I'm able to interview a lot of people from the playlist. So artists that we show love to on the playlist come in the office and we do podcasts. And my biggest vision for the podcast is similar to what you were saying when people hit you up in your DMs, like to check out their music. People hit me in my DMs all the time to check out their music or to, um, you know, give them advice or they ask me questions about their career, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And luckily for me, now I'm able to post content that they can learn from. Because mm-hmm. every time I interview an artist, a manager, a producer, I try to at least ask them one question where they could give some insight that someone could learn from. Because I feel like the people who are DMing me all day long are the people who are listening to my podcast. Right. So, you know, I interviewed Kuko's manager, Doris Munoz, and we talked about touring because he's done a lot of shows. We talked about doing a label deal because he's signed. Um, I interviewed... ASAP Ferg's manager, we talked about brand deals. I interviewed an emerging producer, and I was like, what's something people don't know about the producer, Grind? Mm -hmm. I think he only has Terror Gav, Gavin. He's a great guy. Uh, I think he, I don't know how many followers he has. He might have like 500 something, 600 followers, Mm -hmm. but he's someone that I believe in, and he's someone that I show a lot of love on the playlist. So I was like, I want you on my podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't need big superstars on my podcast. I'll take them. Right. But like, I don't need them. Like I had Key Glock on there. That was really cool. Um, He gave some great advice. Key Glock gave some great advice about when he was coming up and how he got his music heard. Mm -hmm. You know, like I asked people questions like that. How did he get his music heard? He was, I don't remember all the details. You'd have to check out my podcast. (laughs) But um, he was like posting on social media and like not giving up. Mm-hmm. And he just was like using whatever platform was out there at the time. And I guess it shows a lot of humility, you mm-hmm. know, and hunger. And he he gave like the, all the examples of what he was doing. And it's just cool, I think, for a kid who's in their basement making music to hear like an artist that's established with a whole lot of money and jewelry and cars and success or whatever mm-hmm. that people think is success, you know, talk about when they were in the same spot. Right. For sure. Hundred percent. Where do you uh, where do you see the podcast going? Do you have any next steps for it? Right now, I'm doing it and I'm having fun and I'm just getting content out there. I'm just executing. Right. I don't know where it's gonna go. Right. Right. For sure. Um, so, would you say it's uh, primarily for people in the business, artists, or all the above for our listeners? I think it's for people in the industry, artists. Aspiring artists, aspiring managers, um, early on stages of anyone who wants to be in the music industry. But ideally, it'd be for anyone who wants to hear a cool story, which is like how I'm interviewing people who I think are cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get some um, knowledge out of them. I think if I get to the point where someone's like, wow, I love this podcast so much. I don't care who the guest is. That's my goal. You know, I'm sure it's the same goal for you guys. Like. People don't know who I am and they they listen to this and they're like, wow, that that was cool. You know what I mean? Because they like you guys, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. like that's my goal. That's exciting, man. Right. What's been your biggest, uh, the lessons learned so far in producing the podcast and becoming a a host? Um, You know, I was kind of disappointed in some podcast episodes because I, I noticed that not everyone is that great at giving an interview. You know, like not everyone is media trained, obviously, but early on in people's careers, like it's a little tough getting a getting a great interview all the time. Mm -hmm. Like no one's been horrible, Mm -hmm. but sometimes I have such I'm so excited for the interview and I'm like, this is my personal favorite new artist. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then we get sit down for the interview and I'm like, damn, I wish they would have said a little bit more on this topic. So maybe it's just on me to get get better at interviewing. But uh 
other things I, I've been learning or noticing, like I said before, the team aspect. Right. Everyone's talking about how important their team is. And it's it's obvious. It's almost like too simple, but I think people overlook that. You know, like your mm-hmm. team is everything. Like even and what I noticed too, which is crazy, is I went back to my old interviews from Hip Hop at Lunch and Wiz Khalifa said something to me in 2009, something about being dropped from Warner back when he was signed to Warner. He said something similar where it was like, you know, I still got my team and I still have, he's like, I still have this thing called Taylor Gang, my movement or whatever, you know, because it was so early on in his career. Yeah. But he was like, I still, you know, I, I'm no longer with the label, but I still have my team. And then I watched this old Yellow Wolf interview I did and he was saying something about how he had his team before he signed to one of these labels. I, I, I don't forget. I forgot which one it was around 2010 or whatever year that was. And he was like, I had my team going into the deal. I had my team during the deal mm-hmm. and I still had my team after the deal. And we all learned a lot from being on the label. But like the biggest thing in my career is my team. Mm-hmm. So it was like people were telling me that back then. People are still telling me that right now. But it's kind of something that I think was like going unnoticed to me a little bit until right. until my I launched my own podcast and it's like everyone keeps telling me the same thing. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's awesome. Who are some people on your team, on your podcast team? And what do they do? So I got Seth. Shout out Seth Seth actually got <laughs> our podcast off the ground too. Hey. Literally like all this all this gear we have yeah, came said, from yeah. Seth's kit.com account and he taught me how to use the zoom yeah when you brought out that equipment i was thinking of seth yeah right away shout out seth seth is the goat he edits every single podcast episode i have that's amazing he listens to them all and then we have conversations and a lot of times when the artists are in the office before they leave i introduce them to seth and i'm like hey man this is the guy who's going to be listening to this Mm -hmm. he's going to learn a lot about your life that's awesome he's the man that's awesome. And all the artists like shake his hands. <laughs> um, we have D Kirk, who does all the graphic video work for me. Chef D Kirk. Yeah. Cooking it up. Always, <laughs> always. Yeah, shout out to D Kirk. He's also an artist. Um, you can find his music on Spotify, Apple, wherever. And then we have Dustin. He films all the podcasts. He do, He records them. He's really great at his job. And we have Nick Bolin, who uh, is in the podcast room with me every time, taking nice. b- taking BTS photos, just learning, listening. Um, he's kind of like my right-hand guy. You That's know, awesome. like, he's with me all the time. Messed up. I don't think I'm forgetting anyone. It's right. a pretty small team. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And in, in the meantime, we're going to shout out Noah. Yeah, our third member of the yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah. Solid partner on the music yeah. podcast. We love Noah too. Yeah, right, right. Um, and Dave, and got Dave, D- Dave my man, down Dave. In the Philippines. He's our my our, man, our Dave. Mixing space <laughs> 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 Oh man, um, when I, I do want to keep pressing into teams, not necessarily the podcast team, but I think you obviously have gotten a lot of exposure to lots of different teams across industries, both within the music industry, on the, the artists, management teams, label teams, um, in the brand side, I mean, in the Vayner ad agency side, right? I think you have unique exposure to all these different verticals. When it comes to high-performing teams or high-performing individuals, what are some different trends or traits you've noticed? Communication. Um, kind of like how you were saying earlier, talk to people. It doesn't have to be just about work, you know? Like, I talk to Richie South every day. And there was a period of time when I wasn't talking to him every day. But luckily, I'm back on talking every day. It's like the best to be communicating with people you work with. When I'm at VaynerMedia, you know, I like see someone in the hallway, show them a lot of love, Mm -hmm. walk by their desk. When I have artists come in, I introduce them to a ton of people at the office, you know, make everyone feel involved, but also Mm -hmm. impress the artists by everyone showing them what they work on. Right. Um, But yeah, the best team members, I think, communicate, Mm over-communicate. Sometimes just communicate for fun. You know, like, just, you're like, hey, I'm doing this today. And no one even cares, but you just told them anyway. (laughs) Right, right, right. (laughs) And I imagine you have to do that a lot because, you know, your co-manager's in LA, you're here. You know, Mm -hmm. Richard South is in Atlanta, right? Yeah. Southside. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bet, bet. 
Makes sense. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that's where the name comes from. Yeah. Um, so you kind of have to, you know, or else, you know, things might, things might slip. Mm-hmm. So that's dope. Yeah. And then communicating with the brands, actually, you know, we had this one slight miscommunication recently where we were talking about doing something with the festival and it was a backstage basketball court, but someone called it a VIP basketball court. And that someone could have been myself, but <laughs> someone called it a VIP basketball court. And then the client was thinking, oh, VIP basketball court, a whole lot of like people with the VIP bracelets are going to be there. There's going to be tons of people. But I started telling everyone, you know, don't say VIP, say backstage because there's not going to be VIP bracelet people there. It makes a huge difference if you say backstage because it's only going to be artists and managers and PR agents mm-hmm. like it's really exclusive. It's not going to be, you're not going to be able to do a content capture with a whole lot of industry people or fans like who have VIP bracelets shooting a basketball, mm-hmm. like it was going to be a basketball court. And uh, it was just because of that one word miscommunication, it wasn't overly communicated that it was mm. a very small space. Then the client was like thinking about how much they were going to spend and what type of footage they were going to get with all these VIP bracelet holders. And it just became a whole nightmare. It's like one word messed up everything. Mm-hmm. If we had just said backstage instead of VIP, there would have been less confusion. Mm-hmm. Right, right, for right. sure. So you just got to communicate. You got to over communicate. You know, you can't assume someone knows what backstage basketball court means. Right. Totally. 100%. Right. When it comes to um, the brand, de- br- brand deals, so you've worked on a lot of brand deals, kind of helping brands remain relevant and gain relevance in audience mind share across target audiences. What do you think are, um, if you're an artist, how should you think about going to get brand deals and how can you approach it? If you're an artist, I think you need to look at a brand deal as a step on your resume. You know, I think too, uh, well not, I think a lot of artists are a little bit too uh, slow to do a brand deal. You know, this, I don't know what the thinking is exactly, but if you're open to doing a deal, like your first deal might not be the best deal, but it'll lead to your second deal. You know, like mm-hmm. I think a lot of times you got to think there's a there's a person sitting at a desk who's trying to like get approval from their boss. And if they see that you've done a deal, they know that someone has vetted you. Mm-hmm. So they have less work to do to vet you. So you're probably going to get another deal mm-hmm. quicker, you know, and um, you know, just because you do a deal with Puma early on doesn't mean you can't work with Kanye later, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are afraid of doing that type of stuff. But I think the artist needs to over-deliver as well because mm-hmm. that's how you um, get bigger opportunities and that's mm-hmm. how you get more opportunities with the same brand. Right, for sure. And then, I mean, do you think artists should – proactively go out and just be approaching brands to try and drum up their first opportunities before it kind of makes a shift to the point where brands are coming to them. Yeah, if they can, I don't think it hurts. Cause like I said earlier, you know, I'll work with anyone on a brand deal, but it's not a lot of times it's easy to work with the people you already know. Mm-hmm, for sure. Do you feel like it's really important to have like a clean presence on social media? Have you, have you have brands, and you had to pull away from certain artists because they don't keep a clean enough image online. Yeah, we've had to, a lot of brands don't want to work with artists who don't have clean images online. But I'll say that I think the best thing an artist can do is just be themselves because right. no one wants to work with an artist that's lying either. Right. For you know, sure. like if you really do that type of stuff, then like you just got to own it. Mm-hmm. Totally. What have been some of your biggest brand campaigns? By the way, Super uh, the, the Sabra... Super Bowl commercial was awesome. Yeah. We got some dope artists on that one. Megan the Stallion. Let's go. Becky G. Um, yeah, a lot of people. But Megan the Stallion and Becky G were the two people that I helped put on there. Mm-hmm. But it was there were so many people who worked on that Sabra commercial, man. Like so many people. Mm-hmm. And uh I just helped out with again like the music aspect, like right. helping helping get artists because they if you watch the commercial, there's so many different types of people from so many different walks of life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I helped out with the music part. But I right. will say, like, you know, like we had, I had some phone calls at like one or two in the morning mm-hmm. because Becky G's manager was in Australia or, you know, like this or that. Like, mm-hmm. it's not easy. Yeah. But yeah. 
you know, I was just one person on that on that campaign. There mm-hmm. was a lot of people because you know a lot goes into a Super Bowl commercial, right? So that was crazy. But uh, different brand deals. Um, you know, a lot of times you can't even talk about a lot of these brand deals. But I know in the New York Times article we talked about the Miracle Whip brand deal, right? And uh, we had Young Baby Tate in Atlanta make a song. She produced it and she wrote the lyrics, and we paid her. And she made video content for Twitter and Instagram, and Mm -hmm. it was a great deal for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. That's super exciting. Do you feel like more and more brands will, over the course of the next five to ten years and beyond, really start to shift and lean a lot heavier into like artist-centric influencer marketing? Yeah, I think they will. What? Why? Not that I disagree, but (laughs) more brands doing it. I think it's just the easy way to connect with young consumers. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think all almost all brands should be doing it if they can. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you find the right. I think the trick, I think the real trick is to find an emerging artist. Mm-hmm. You know, like like if I see some big superstar drinking a certain drink, I don't believe it. Right. Unless like. Unless they go so far above and beyond, you know, like I was saying mm-hmm. earlier, like you got to go above and beyond for the best type of situations. Right. For sure. But if you see an emerging artist doing a drink, drinking a drink, like doing whatever type of brand, wearing some type of clothes, it's like you believe it more on the one hand. But then even if like, let's say they're just doing it for the check, you still know that they're not rich enough to have that much clothes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're like, yeah, you're probably wearing that all the time. Mm hmm. Or like you're probably drinking that a lot because they gave it to you. Right. Where it's like, and the the young emerging artists have a fan base where it's like the fans are just so in love with the artist that they'll do what the artist is doing. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. 100%. I feel like engagement there probably is the metric that's more important than just like how famous you are or how many streams you have, right? Um, I think now with social media, especially like, artists can have like real cult followings Mm -hmm. because they can, because the people that are really into them can follow them on everything and know what they're doing like 24 hours a day. If the artist chooses, you know? Um, And I think that's when these emerging acts and you may, you know, I think this is what you're saying, but when these emerging acts are so important, when that connection still feels really personal with their fans. So it doesn't necessarily seem like this person is, you know, doing this brand deal just because, but they actually want to introduce this brand or co-sign this brand because they already wear this brand and are, and are just revealing that to their fans or something. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's when it feels the most natural, but branding is always really interesting for that because it's sort of, there's an A&R process involved in that too. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like a lot. So um, yeah, that's cool. So um, I also want to talk about just like you and your relationship generally. And Sam, you can talk about this. You could talk about this too, because you also worked at Vayner Media, but just seeing Gary grow over the course of a decade. I mean, boy, you've been there since like the the jump. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, even yeah, like living together. Weren't you like sleeping on a in his <laughs> apartment or like what's the the full story? But yeah, I'll tell some, you. Like apartment sharing at one point to yeah. get the business off the ground. Hell yeah! And I just need to say something real quick about the last idea. You know, if you see an emerging artist like working with a brand, you know that brand paid them. So like sometimes you even like the brand just for that, right? You're yeah, like, you're true. like, yeah, true. you you mess with my favorite artist, so like I mess with you. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. True, it's yeah. true, for sure. But yeah, Gary, um, it's crazy, man. When VaynerMedia started, it was very much a startup, and uh, yeah, I did sleep on the floor a couple times. You know, not all the time, but it was really just out of necessity to get work done real fast, like. Like when I was a blogger, I wanted my videos to be first. You know, Mm -hmm. like I was like, oh man, I went to this great show last night. I need my video to be first on the internet. I need my interview to go up before anyone else. So I was living in uh, Morningside Heights, which is right below Harlem, right above the Upper West Side. And the office was in the Tribeca. And so, you know, I'd go to a show in Brooklyn, go to the show, wait for an artist, wait for hours, you know, to get my chance to interview him. It'd be super late at night, wait for the train. The train doesn't come that often late at night compared to during the day, you know, Mm -hmm. as you guys know. So, like, by the time I get back to Morningside Heights, it's already so late. Only get so many hours of sleep. Have to go back to the office. Like, it just made more sense. It was like, you know, I could go sleep at the office. (laughs) 
you wake up early and get to straight to work. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason people know I slept at the office a couple of times is because one time there was a local news station, I think, that came to do a story on Gary. And when they walked in the office, I was literally underneath the pool table, <laughs> po- uh, ping pong table, sleeping. <laughs> and I think I think the the news people were like, "Oh man, what the hell?" But but Gary was like, "No, this is what's up. This is what it's about. <laughs> it's not, not we're hustling." That's so <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, man. It was so much fun. Like it wasn't like it is today. Like sleeping at the office wasn't a weird thing. Right, right, you right. You know, I mean, I might have been the only person to do it, but mm-hmm. it wasn't like that weird. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it was like hustle, 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 fun. Like we were all like best friends. Mm-hmm. Like the whole company went out to eat lunch together for right. people's birthdays. It was cool. And what do you feel like? I mean, I now it's at what, like seven or eight hundred people total? Yeah, close to nine hundred. That's Damn. amazing. What do you feel like have been some of the big uh, turning points, or that have enabled the growth and trajectory that it's been on? Um, we hired a lot of key people from other agencies, from you know, I don't even know where, but we would hire like big, big people for these big positions in the company, and they would just grow you know, and get a lot more clients. So if you get a new client, you need more employees right. to work the client. Um, you know, I left VaynerMedia in 2012 and I came back, I don't know when, maybe maybe 2016, 2017. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they did a lot of growth in that time. But, you know, Gary just works hard. You know, Gary, like people, people think Gary's doing a whole lot of like, fun stuff all the time but he's really working all the time right um you know like he he has a family but he he works during the work day it's just when they chop up those videos they only include the fun stuff because no one wants to watch the boring stuff right it's just so, like a live feed of him at his desk or something yeah no, one wants- <laughs> no, no that's not true though gary is never at a computer oh what? i don't even think he owns a computer yeah i don't i you know i've seen him like with a notebook recently in some meetings, and I'm like, whoa. That's- <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. what is he writing down? Yeah. But, uh, which I think is awesome from a business standpoint to be able to get to the point where you have like such an empowering team around you to the point where you're, you're just in decision making mode always and, and kind of building excitement. There's a level of like charisma and enthusiasm, but ultimately it's like, Gary, here's your brief. This is the meeting you're walking into with this person. Here's the context. And he's like, oh, got it. In there, boom, boom, boom. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, but Super I will, cool. you know what I will say is uh, I travel a lot lately mm-hmm. and I'm getting really used to working on my phone only. Interesting. Like, like when I'm at work, right? I don't bring my computer to work. Interesting. I just work on my phone. That's cool. And like, I think Gary's maybe light years ahead of me on that. Yeah, for sure. But like, like how you said, you don't really see him with the computer a lot. Mm-hmm. But you always see him with his phone in his hand. Yeah, for sure. So like, I think he's, you know, like, yeah, I'll send him an email. He'll I mean, email me back pretty quick. Yeah. So crazy. like, he yeah. is, he is, he is working. Yeah. It's just, he's not working in the same way that other people are working. Yeah. I also feel like, and he has a valuable you the way he uses social media is fundamentally different than the average people because the average person consumes. And I think if you were to break down the percentage of his time when he's on those apps or platforms, he's either it's probably like ninety or ninety five five, where that ninety five percent of time is going towards actually creating content, stories, commenting, engaging with other people. And there's probably this very limited amount of time when he's actually just kind of consuming content. Whereas I think for the average person, it's this like mi- mind, exactly this like mindless consumption. Yeah. So I think that's pretty fascinating too. What in your perspective? Um, I mean, you've been in a, in a lot of like Gary artist meetings and set up most yeah. of them, if not all of them. What uh, what's your favorite Gary V artist conversation? Yeah, man. I'll, I'll, tell, one you, of your I'll tell you a couple. Yeah. But I got to comment on what you just said, man. You know, Gary does a lot of listening. Interesting. And yeah, he yeah. does a lot of online. He does mm-hmm. a lot of reading of the comments, too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To inform, right, right. To- so that's how he's, that's one of the reasons why he knows so much about, like, what's going on is because he's, like, he's, like, studying how people react. Mm, right. You know? Mm-hmm. So, empathy. yeah, like, he 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 surprises me. All, very often with how much he knows about these artists I bring in. Yeah. Yeah. Like he'll mention a song 
And like, even sometimes the artist is like, really? You know that song? And then Gary will quote it and we're all like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> or like, like we were in the studio with Lil Yachty and Gary was like, oh man, you remember that Jay-Z song where he shouted out all these other artists and like showed love and it was like kind of unnecessary, but it was like such a cool move. And we're all like, what? No, what? And, <laughs> and he was like, pull up the Blueprint 3. Pull up this exact song. And he, like we, he played it and we're all like, whoa. <laughs> and he like knew the lyrics. That's crazy. And we're like, whoa, man. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> that, song, that album came out 10 years ago. And yeah. How did you know that? And like, why do you know that? Like, why yeah. is that such a good memory you have? Was that Death of Auto Tune? Um, I think it was the same album. It was the white white one with three red stripes. Yeah, yeah. I only remember one line on Death Auto Tune, and he said something like, "I might have to do a mixtape Wheezy or something like that." And he started shouting out rappers, but I don't think it was like Rapid Procession or anything like that. But damn. it was a different song. It was a song with uh, J Cole. I think I don't know. Oh, I don't know which Star song is it was. Born. It Star might have been that born. song. I only know because I was just listening to Jay because he just put all his stuff back up on Spotify yeah. like a couple months ago. Yeah, a couple, like a month, month and a half ago. So I've just been listening to a lot of Jay-Z. If you want to know what song it was, DM Gary. Because <laughs> <laughs> they played it for it and he shouts out like 30 rappers all in a row. That's Damn. crazy. It's crazy. But uh, the best Gary meetings, we had a really great meeting with Kyle. Mm, that was super little, duper Kyle? Yeah, super duper Kyle. That was a lot of fun. But we just met with Jada Kiss this past week, and, and, and what makes it what I mean for that Kyle one before we jump back to Jada, what uh, made that meeting incredible, or what did you really glean or take away from that? I think meetings are incredible when we get into the artist story a lot, and we get to like brainstorm with the artist mm-hmm. on the spot. So the Kyle meeting was years ago. I don't remember everything about it. I just remember like leaving that meeting and telling someone like, "Wow, that was one of the best meetings I've ever been in." Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. And I don't say that all the time. I said it this week after the Jadakiss meeting because um, it's not even out yet, but Gary and Jadakiss talked about the Knicks. Gary and Jadakiss um, talked a whole lot about like New York stuff. Like it was just a lot of fun. And then I brought up how Jadakiss has been killing it with documenting his latest press run. And we talked about how important that is. We talked about having a team, like how Gary has a team of like 31 people. We talked about um tiktok you know we talked about all these cool relevant topics and it ended with us being like yeah let's go get dinner and jam more Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was it was just a cool it was a really cool meeting where it was like equally about jadakiss equally about gary you know what i mean it Mm -hmm. was it wasn't one-sided it wasn't um all about gary it wasn't all about the artist it was it was a fun exchange and everyone was like really happy that's cool I like. I think that you bring back the Kyle meeting too. I think I recall watching that, and I think I remember Kyle telling the story about he almost didn't release. I yeah, Spy, which ended up becoming his biggest song ever. Yeah, um, still, and I think obviously, I think one of Gary's like frequent points as far as advice to musicians is just like be consistent, just release, release. Don't be overly precious but i think he caveats that too and like gives respect to the fact that there's a level of like artistic integrity so you can't just like put it out if you're not proud but i think oftentimes artists skew too much on withholding because they're waiting for perfection rather than releasing i was gonna say what i hear there is more insecurity than like it can it can it can air on insecurity more than artistic integrity where it's like i don't want to put this song out because i'm afraid of what people say as opposed to i don't like this record and i'm not going to put it out because i don't like it Interesting. The stuff that I hear is usually, I like this. I don't know if other people will like it. I need to work on myself. <laughs> it's right. like if you like it, you know, maybe you should put it out because mm-hmm. you don't, you can't think for other people. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. So yeah, and I've I've heard stories like I think Future held on to the Turn on the Lights song for a couple years because he was like waiting for the right time to drop it, mm. and he dropped it on his uh, Pluto album, I think. So. I've heard that type of story too, where people are holding on to songs and they do release them. They're just like waiting for some moment. Right. But the best, the best meeting we ever had was with Nipsey Hussle. You know, R R P to Nipsey Hussle. That was the best meeting we ever had, just because of how smart Nipsey is and or was, and uh, it was just fun, just uh, vibing out with them in the studio. That was the best meeting we ever had. Yeah. That's dope, man. Nipsey Hussle was my favorite rapper. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. Yeah. yeah, I used to tell people all the I used to tell people in the tech world, I'd be like, you need to book this guy 
to speak. Mm-hmm. Like you need to book him to give a talk. And the people I spoke to never did it, but he was just so smart, which is why when I got the opportunity to introduce Gary to him, I was so excited because mm. I was like, this is a person. Like I saw him speak one time and he was speaking with someone else who was like highly educated, like um, in the college programs. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't know if Nipsey also went to college or not, but this other person like went to Harvard and like had all these degrees and mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. And they were talking about the same stuff. And when the person who had gone to Harvard and everything was speaking, I wasn't understanding what he was talking about. Mm. But then when <laughs> Nipsey Hussle was explaining it, I was like, wow, I get it. You know what I mean? And I was like, mm-hmm. this person is so smart. And at the same time, they're able to like really get people to understand what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. It was just like, I need, I need Gary to meet this guy. So that was the best meeting we ever did. It was probably the one that's the most watched as well. Mm-hmm. That one in our logic meeting, our logic meeting has a ton of views. Yeah. What's, what's the lens at which you, I mean, when it comes to your strategy for Gary, which is a big part of your job and, maintaining that level of relevance and building up those that kind of the network what um i mean how, how are you evaluating like what artists make sense to like broker those meetings and collapse i know you mentioned you have other, i mean you have your own you have the playlist the 137 the kind of gaming with different artists so it's obviously not like every artist engagement is going straight to gary but at this point like what is the filter you're using for those gary meetings um if someone's really buzzing i want them to meet gary if someone's has a really great content and I believe, like I mm-hmm. really believe, I want Gary to meet him. Like that's why we met with Gunna early. Mm-hmm. That's why we met with Tierra Whack early before mm-hmm. Whack World was out. Like we, mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I love this artist, Tierra Whack. And, you know, I was putting her on the playlist and like every week. One time I put her on, I think one time I put like four or five of her songs on the playlist and we only have like 11 songs on the playlist. And I went and I saw Gary at some dinner meeting with a whole bunch of like old businessmen. And Gary was like, this is the guy who runs my playlist. And one of the old businessmen was like, hey, I love the playlist. But you put this one artist on there way too much this week. That's my only feedback. Like, it wasn't that good. And I was like, was it Tierra Whack? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, that's exactly what I wanted people to say because I wanted people to remember I playlisted her before she became famous. I was yeah, like, yeah. she's about to be huge. Mm-hmm. I was like, I need people to notice. Right. Because if I only played her once, people would not remember it. But I like, I like jarred the playlist. Yeah. It was like shocking. It was like yeah. a shock to your system if you're in the gym. Mm-hmm. Cause I like played so much of her music. Right. So like, um, you know, anyone I'm super passionate about, we meet with cause Gary, trust me. But also Gary will listen to the music when we both, like Gary says it a lot, when we both connect, like when I love an artist and he loves the artist at the same time, mm-hmm. those are the best meetings. That's, that, that's yeah. when we go super hard. Um, so like Tierra Wack, Gunna, Lil' Keed, 645AR. Um, people like that, we've just been early on. Like when Gary met 645AR, he had like 3,000 Instagram followers. Now he has like 48,000, which still isn't even that much, but... You know, we're pretty early on him. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, other than that, people who, you know, Gary's so big now, people are DMing him. Like Uzi Vert's DMing him a lot. Metro Boom is DMing him a lot. Meek Mill. You know, various Becky G. Various people are DMing mm-hmm. Gary a lot. And so it's kind of like, you know, I'll reach out to their people and I'll be like, hey, you know, your artist is talking to Gary. How about we get him together in real life? Right. Mm -hmm. So like that, you know, and then sometimes Gary will, Gary's funny because Gary will be listening to music and he'll send me a screenshot of a song and he'll be like, yo, I want to meet this guy or this girl. And uh, I set it up Mm -hmm. because I need everything to be super authentic to Gary. So Mm -hmm. like it might be an artist that I don't even like, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, if Gary likes him or her, him or her, and they're not talking about crazy stuff, like, let's do it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Have you guys ever really deferred like super harshly? Where you was like, "Hey, yo, what? You sure, Gary? Like, what the? F- <laughs> luckily, <laughs> like, not really. <laughs> luckily, no, because he picks artists that aren't, you know, like aren't too offensive. Right, right. Or, or you know, not you got you guys taste the line enough where that wouldn't happen. Also, yeah, it wouldn't happen. I mean, Gary has Gary has taste, and I'm there, but 
the fun thing is, is that the cool thing about Gary and the cool thing about my podcast, like I was saying earlier, is if we believe in someone, we'll take the meeting. Mm-hmm. Even if, like, let's say we meet with someone and they never make it, like they never even remotely make it. They're not even close to ever making it in their lives, but the music's good. No one could ever really clown us for that because it's like we're supporting good artists. Right. And we're, we're, we're supporting people we believe in and we're right. supporting people who are making music and art that needs a spotlight. So like, you know, not all the best artists make it and not all the, not all the artists that make it are the ones that we're interviewing. We're interviewing people we believe in. Right. Can you dive into the, I know you guys both have this kind of like thesis of like hip hop rules the world and, um, where hip hop is ultimately one of the biggest cultural trendsetters and everything in culture stems from hip hop and hip hop culture. Can you, I mean, what is, can you dive into the thesis from your guys' perspective or from your perspective specifically as to the cultural importance of hip hop beyond hip hop culture? I think it's the number one genre, right? It's like pop music. Yeah. It's like everyone likes it, you know? Um, and I think it's cool. Like to me, it's fun. To me, it's, um, it's everything. It's, it's educational. It's fun. It's a lot of emotion at times. It's beautiful. You know, like it's all, there's so many sub genres within hip hop that you got it all there. And, um, you know, Gary's the one who said hip hop rules the world. And I think that's part of what he meant was it was just like, you know, if you want to be relevant, you got to go where all the attention is. Mm -hmm. And like I said, to begin, it's like hip hop is so popular. Like it's almost what people would call pop music and then Latin trap and um, music in Spanish in general is getting crazy, crazy popular, every more popular every single day. And, Lately, Gary's been talking about how that's where the attention is, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah, it's getting yeah. huge. It's yeah, like huge. Gary, Gary's Gary been, like, for years almost, Gary's been talking about Bad Bunny, mm-hmm. J Balvin, Nicky Jam, like, all the people that we talk to or meet with. Um, and he's, like, telling brands and telling me and telling people, like, oh, we need to, we need to work with these artists more and stuff like that, you know? So mm-hmm. I think... When Gary says hip hop, Gary says a lot of things and I see people not understand it fully because it's like a quote taken out of context. Right. Mm. I see that all the time. And when he gets a chance to fully explain things and everyone's like, oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, What do you think in terms of just mindset that you've learned from Gary Vee throughout all this? I mean, you know, people are following him on Instagram, looking at all the videos, you know, going through all his content, but you actually work with him like every day. So what are some some key lessons you learned over just the past 10 years of knowing him? Number one thing I learned is be the biggest, be the bigger person. It always pays off. You know, like I've been in a lot of situations where people have like done me wrong or I felt like I was done wrong or this or that. And Gary's always been there to tell me like, you know, you got to be the bigger person here. You got to forgive and forget move Mm -hmm. on um forgive and learn something maybe that's what i should say like you know learn from your experiences but you got to forgive people and uh other than that like a second biggest thing i learned from gary is you got to execute and keep it going you know like like with my podcast i waited to do it for a while and it was just kind of like you know what just do it you know i launched even right now i have enough episodes for like two weeks i don't know who i'm going to interview next I don't even care. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not concerned. I'm just going. I'm just doing it. Um, I care enough that, like, I won't just interview anyone, but I don't care that I only have two in the in the pocket, you know? Mm-hmm. And, like, when I launched the website, the Hip Hop at Lunch website, it was the worst looking website you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. It was purple and black. And I think the logo looked like Batman. And it was just <laughs> so bad. And I interviewed Wyclef. And different people, I can't even believe they said yes. But I just, it was just kind of like, Gary was like, all right. When he hired me, he was like, you start tomorrow. And I think we launched the site two days after I started. So it was just kind of like, he was like, you know, there's no point in wasting time. He's like, just, 
just do the site, learn as you go, execute, and keep it moving. You know what I mean? Like that's his mindset. Like, like if 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 you're able to start a podcast on Anchor, just start it, then like move on to the next stop. You know what I mean? Like then get a studio space, then then get real microphones. But like that's what I learned from Gary is like don't wait, just do it. And you'll learn as you go and get better as you go. But no one no one remembers the bad stuff anyway. Like if, if you do a podcast with the next Scooter Braun, people will remember that one. But if you do a podcast with someone who no one likes in 10 years, like no one's going to care. No one even no one even remembers. No one even listened to it, you know. So don't right. worry about it. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. Cool. So closing question. What are you most excited about for the rest of the year? I'm most excited about Richie South. I think he's going to have a big year. He's been working a lot with Playboy Cardi, been working a lot with Future. He's open to working with anyone that makes sense right now. He's not holding back. So I'm most excited about Richie. Um, I'm still having fun with my podcast. I'm still going to have fun with my podcast. Trying to get Gary to meet Meg the Stallion. Trying to get Gary to meet Bad Bunny. Trying to get Gary to meet... Jack Harlow, which is going to happen this week. Um, let's see. Really just keeping it moving, man. Now that I'm married, every day is a blessing. No. <laughs> we'll have to cut off that clip so you can send it to YT. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mike, man, super grateful to have you on. Always love crossing the hallways, uh, crossing the paths with you in the hallways at Vayner, man. So, very um, excited to see all the continued progress and success for you and everything you're doing over there, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Woo! Got him. God damn. <laughs> yeah, with the, the G-O-T. T-A-U-M. God damn. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great episode. I think uh, Mike shed tons of light on a bunch of awesome topics. I think uh, really loved just his perspective on networking. And I think even today, uh, he just has developed all these different mechanisms of providing value to other people, oftentimes through exposure, whether it's on this playlist or on his podcast or brokering connections with Gary. But I think even before we, um, I mean, obviously it helps and you can kind of like tout the and, and leverage Gary's persona and brand and the exposure that'll drive but even prior to that he started his own blog and was hustling and going out of his way to set up these interviews i think uh whenever when you're looking to network and develop relationships just finding ways to create value to the point where people will want to spend time with you um and and build that relationship and then sustain it nurture it i think it's incredibly valuable and i think as a result mike is one of the the more connected people I know and has just an incredible ear and really understands what's what's next. So very excited to see his continued path and everything he's cooking up. Yeah, man. I thought everything we talked about on there was super dope. I mean, you know, um, I think we came with some really good questions that were able to give people a really good uh, viewpoint, a few different things in the music industry, networking, uh, managing, managing a producer, what it's like to bring a co-manager on and why. Um, what it's like to curate a playlist, what it's like to to be super, to be on an artist first, some of the strategy that goes behind this playlisting. Um, brand deals, we covered a lot of things in this episode, you know, so I'm very glad that for, for, for myself that I got to learn from him and that our listeners will too. Totally. Well, appreciate you all greatly for tuning in week in, week out. As always, don't hesitate to leave a review wherever you listen to the podcast. It helps us continue to grow, double down on the things we know you love. So once again, thank you all. Thank we, you. We appreciate y'all. We out.